Hi, I'm Chuck Lennock. I'm a reenactor. And doing historical reenactment on the weekends led to being a reenactor in a classroom for 36 years. I would use whatever I picked up in my hobby to help me research further and try to bring history to life in the classroom. I guess that's why they call it living history, right? And try to convince my students that history was so much more than identifying famous dead people in the back of the book. So to that end, I would wear the garb for the time period. It's garb, not costumes. And make myself very difficult to ignore. And I would have the music playing in the background for whatever time period we were covering, so it would be essentially a soundtrack to history. And I'd bring in the art, and I would bring in artifacts, uh, basically stuff kids could touch, and make this essentially a portable museum that was kid-friendly. Well, I'm not in the classroom anymore, so I had to repurpose myself. And what I did at first was I created a very pretentious sounding mission odyssey where I was visiting all the different sites of Alta California that were involved with the mission era. But there's so much more to this that I'm expanding the umbrella. And so I will be exploring certain sites uh, while being in garb and telling the stories of these places or following the careers of certain individuals. The Budo Schmidt Tunnel is a landmark over in Kern County, California, near Ridgecrest, also near Randsburg, the living ghost town with a population of 99, Johannesburg with a population of 48, Red Mountain, 131, and the ghost towns of Garlock and Saltdale. It's a pretty desolate area, which became pretty populated when gold was discovered in 1895. William Burrow Henry Schmidt was born in Woonsocket, Rhode Island in January of 1871. As a young man, he was a frail and small of stature person. Six of his brothers and sisters died from tuberculosis. He was expected to face the same fate as his siblings unless he moved to the West with its hot, dry climate. Young Schmidt came to California in 1894, a year before the big gold strike above the Fremont Valley. He prospected around Kern County and eventually established claims in the then remote interior of the El Paso Mountains near Last Chance Canyon. The canyon was known to travelers before Schmidt's day. Some 40 years earlier, in February of 1850, William Lewis Manley passed through on his escape from Death Valley. The mountain range, particularly in to the east near Garlock or Cow Wells, as it had once been called, was an established mining area. But you need to meet several conditions if you want a successful mining operation. A worthwhile body of ore that will allow itself to be separated from the surrounding rock and a transportation infrastructure to move that ore to a processing or distribution facility. Mojave, the local transportation hub where the Southern Pacific Railway had been since 1876, was 20 miles away. Garlock and Randsburg, where mills were also located, they were closer, but there were no roads and only scant trails. Schmidt's primary route of travel, like Manley's, was through Last Chance Canyon. He faced a dangerous ridge between his mining area and the smelter at Mojave, and he said he would never haul his ore to the smelter in Mojave down that back trail using Jack and Jenny, his two burros. Thus, he began his tunnel in 1906, digging, drilling, and blasting his way through the interior of Copper Mountain. Why? Flatlands, meaning easy access to Garlock or Mojave, lay on the other side. 
Schmidt apparently had no formal training in either mining or engineering, which is really comforting when you're walking through that tunnel knowing that. He had no power tools, although the use of such appliances were well established in the mining industry already. He pounded through the solid rock, the granite, with a pick, a four pound hammer, and a hand drill. The broken rock was carried out first on his back, later in a wheelbarrow. Schmidt would eventually install iron tracks and a mine car to transport debris from the growing tunnel. The tunnel itself was about six feet tall and 10 feet wide, but it cut through solid granite and required little shoring. The path wasn't particularly straight, and it took several turns, but then remember, he was an amateur at this. Schmidt lived a solitary and frugal existence in the high desert. His only companions were the burros Jack and Jenny, so locals dubbed him Burro Schmidt. His clothes got patched with flour sacks, and tin cans ended up mending the soles of his shoes. An old cast iron stove purchased secondhand, cooked his meals, and heated his one-room cabin, which was insulated with old magazines. Two of his favorite meals were supposed to have been pancakes and a fish chowder made from sardines, rice, and boiled onions. When he could afford it, when he was feeling particularly flush, Schmidt burned kerosene in his lamps. When kerosene became an unobtainable luxury, he used candles, but he limited himself to one two-cent candle each day. Burro's mining was done mostly by hand. At first, there was little need for shoring because it was carved through solid granite. He excavated almost 2,500 feet of solid granite using just a pick and shovel and a four pound hammer for the first part. However, he suffered injuries and was repeatedly trapped by falling rocks and eventually he put in a mining cart on rails. Some explosives were meticulously placed for the balance of the excavation, but keeping in character with his tight-fisted, frugal nature, okay, he was cheap, Schmidt would cut the fuses as short as possible. Once the fuse was lit, he literally would run for his life towards the end of the tunnel and throw himself to the ground to avoid being struck by the force of the blast and the debris. Sometimes either his fuses were too short or he didn't run fast enough because he would occasionally show up injured at another prospector's shack. Work progressed slowly. With just a wheelbarrow, he was thought to have carried 5,800 tons of rock to finish the job. Now, Schmidt would hire out during the summer months on Kern River ranches in order to generate income to support his digging. A good road finally got built in the 1820s through Lower Last Chance Canyon to the Dutch cleanser mine at uh, Cudahy Camp, which connected with the rail line extended from Mojave in, eight, or in 1909. This is going to make the tunnel unnecessary, but Schmidt's in his 50s, and he continued digging. Some, including Schmidt himself, said the tunnel had become an obsession. Others suspected it was not a desire to punch through the mountain that motivated his digging, but a vein of gold extending in that direction. In the end, it didn't matter. He continued tunneling until 1938 when daylight was finally visible through the far end of his tunnel. In that year, he had achieved his goal, having dug nearly 2,500 2, feet of solid granite with the pick, the shovel, a four pound hammer, and explosives. 5,800 tons of rock had been hollowed out of Copper Mountain. That is like painfully bright in the dark. Yep. Boop. You want to do it again later? I'm going to have to
And just to let you know, this is not the surface of the earth. We're underground. We actually have a chamber here. What was that? We actually have like a room. Yeah. A drift. Line. Yeah. I'm pretty impressed actually. Oh, still got a little bit of light there. Curiosity overcomes claustrophobia. Because <laughs> you know me. <laughs> you gotta turn around your back yet. I know. Are you not walking all the way to the other side? No, I'm not when we get to the other side, so I kinda wanna walk back. I think this is just a smile on your back. You can't see the entrance of it. Yeah, no, I can see the light from it. Okay, and I just couldn't oh, see. Yeah. yeah. Until the end. I think, it, yeah. I think it goes only like 30 yards, 40 yards. Okay. So everyone remember on the way back. <laughs> we go. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, your head. Well, I did because I tripped. Um. How do you trip up? I trip over a stone. Oh. Actually, I tripped over my own feet and I went that way. I'm trying to keep Was it right or left? Right. I know it hasn't changed. It hit my head. And I tripped. Okay. Coming up on the exit. Or the other entrance, depending upon if you want to be. You know, upbeat. <sighs> so this wood that's down here, who put that in? I think for uh, the smith yet, because he was hoping to take his little uh, mine cart. Okay. Fly, you fools! Time for the return. Now to the aftermath. The tunnel was useless. There was a perfectly good road now. 67 years old, stooped and gnarled from 32 years or more of 2,000 foot feet of tunneling. Schmidt never used a tunnel to transport ore. He sold the claim to another miner, Mike Lee. 
and he moved elsewhere in the El Pasos. I never made a damn thing out of it, Schmidt said. He retained ownership in several other claims. Uh, the California Journal of Mines and Geology in 1949 showed Schmidt as the owner of the Copper Basin Group of Mines, that was copper, and the Iron Hat Mine, that was about gold. Burro lived another 16 years. He died in January of 1954 at the age of 83 in nearby Ridgecrest. And he's buried in the cemetery in Johannesburg. Robert Ripley, cartoonist, chronicler of human oddities, and author of the Believe It or Not series, features, made Schmidt's legacy known to the world in the 1940s. Ripley called Schmidt the lone miner of the Black Mountain, which I guess sounds cooler than Copper Mountain, and the human mole, and wrote, William H. Schmidt spent 32 years boring through a mountain, the greatest one-man mining achievement in history. He dug the tunnel 2,000 feet long in order to facilitate the shipment of ore. That's Tony Seeger, who came to own the tunnel holding up the Ripley's article. When she passed away, the Bureau of Land Management came to oversee the claim. And Schmidt's cabin in Garlock has been largely abandoned and stands as it was in the 1930s, preserved by the dry climate, but with a lot more vandalism happening. Yeah, this is what? Oh, this is all the, uh, all the graffiti. Oh. Part of the rail. Okay. No? <coughs> has created these mountains. Yes. Yep, what's the, what's the local fault that they expected to have a large rubber? This one? <laughs> <laughs>